every newspaper. Indeed. Today. You, you, are, you are also chair of the FA. And, of course, what people say about Charlton now is that, in a sense, he embodied the values of the game. Well, he... Do you think that that's of another era now that's oh, not yes, going to he... come back? Yeah, yeah. If you read his autobiography, well, he wrote it two, two autobiographies, but he, if you read the autobiography, he talks about, as a young player at Manchester United, the players used to get on the bus to go into, to get on a, a public transport, to go into the centre of Manchester to watch a film. And they used to go to some, used to go to a particular cinema because the, he was a Manchester, yeah. the manager was a Manchester United supporter and let them in for free. Well, the idea that today's footballers need to find, get free movies is, is forgotten. And he, can, he did come from a totally different era, yes. Well, we'll never see that again, I don't think. But thank you, Greg, for that on Sir Bobby Charlton. Let's turn back to the situation in the Middle East now, where Israeli troops are still massing near the border with Gaza. And some aid has made it in from Egypt. Intense diplomatic efforts continue. Rishi Sunak's just back from his trip to the region. And he's returned to a Conservative Party reading from two bruising by-election defeats. A short time ago, I spoke to Immigration Minister Robert Jenrick. Minister, we know that around 20 lorries have crossed from Egypt to Gaza in the past day or so. Do you expect more aid to arrive today and during the week? Well, I think this is a very welcome first step, but it's not the end. We clearly need to work very closely with the United Nations and with Egypt and Israel to ensure that further trucks and consignments of humanitarian goods can come into Gaza. We're coordinating closely with those partners and have been arguing at the highest level for further humanitarian assistance to come to the civilians in Gaza who are suffering. But uh, you know that there are British citizens amongst those civilians in Gaza. Do, do we have any idea yet how many of them there are and if any of them are being held as hostages? Well, there are British nationals who live or have been staying in Gaza and they have... Uh, notified the Foreign Office and registered with them. And we're now keeping in very close contact with them. We're trying to work to enable their uh, exit from Gaza if they wish to do so through the Rafa crossing. At the moment, unfortunately, only humanitarian assistance has been able to pass into Gaza and no individuals, even foreign nationals, have been able to leave. But that's something that we continue to raise with all of the parties and we're doing everything we can to support them. What, what's uh, the scale of it? Last week, uh, the Foreign Secretary told me that 10 would not be an unreasonable estimate. Do you have a better idea today how many British nationals there are? Well, as regards the hostages, as opposed to British nationals who are, who are staying in Gaza, um, we, it's still uh, a complex situation and we're working closely, but that's around the correct number. Um, we've been working with countries around the region, such as Qatar, which is an important uh, and reliable partner in the Middle East, uh, to try to secure the release. We should yep. celebrate the fact that two innocent civilians have now been released, and American nationals, and we will work uh, with all of our partners to try to secure the release of uh, the remaining British citizens who are there. The Foreign Secretary said last week um, that he wanted the Israelis to show restraint and discipline. Uh, other Israeli al allies, Biden and so on, have been saying the same thing. Now, this imminent uh, ground invasion hasn't happened yet, but um, last night the chief of the Israeli general staff, and I want to show you this, issued what I think it could only be described as a pretty bellicose statement. Here's what he said. We will enter the Gaza Strip. We will begin an operational professional mission to destroy the Hamas operatives, the Hamas infrastructure, and we will also keep in our minds the images and the scenes and the fallen from the Shabbat from two weeks ago. That is uh, a commander speaking to his troops on the eve of war, but I think the point here is there is no chance of averting an invasion on the ground, is there? Well, we have confidence that Israel will take all the steps that it can in the circumstances to avoid uh, civilian lives being lost. But the real tragedy here is that Hamas, who started this war by committing those appalling barbaric atrocities 
in Israel deliberately enmesh themselves with the civilian infrastructure in Gaza, using Palestinians, innocent Palestinians, as hostages uh, to their own political aims. And so it, it, it is entirely likely that more civilian lives will be lost in this appalling conflict. Your but we have to defend Israel's right to uh, secure its borders, to release yeah. the, pro the hostages, and to bring a degree of security uh, to their situation. What, what we need Israel to do is to surgically degrade and eradicate Hamas and their infrastructure in the Gaza Strip so that Palestinians can be free from Hamas and Israel can have the security that it needs. You, the, the word you use today is surgically. Last week, James Cleverly talked about restraint and discipline. C can I just ask you about that? Because this is going to be uh, an invasion which uh, takes place in a closed, uh, sort of packed, urban situation, hundreds of kilometres of tunnels, how is it going to be possible for there to be a surgical operation when there are also still a million people, even if the, you know, half of them move to the south, still going to be a million people in there? Well, we believe that Israel's army will use uh, restraint. They've already waited uh, for a significant period before taking further action. They've sought the evacuation of as many people as possible from... Uh, the northern quarter yeah. of the Gaza Strip, and they will do all they can to protect civilian life. But you're, you're absolutely right to say that this is an immensely challenging situation for them and, of course, for innocent Palestinians who we want to do everything we can uh, to protect because they are not Hamas. Hamas is using innocent Palestinians for their own political well, aims. Well, let me ask you about that just very briefly before we move on to your own areas of responsibility. Um, Israel has said that after this part of the operation is over, however it ends, there will be no ties with Gaza. They're going to cut off ties with Gaza, i.e. no water, no power, and the thousands who cross every day to work in Israel will have no access to that work. Do, do you think that's right? Well, that's a decision for, for Israel, and I, I'm not, it's not for the British government to tell them uh, whether or not uh, Palestinians who live in Gaza should okay. be able to go to work in, in Israel. We, of course, okay. want to see a world in which Israel and the Palestinians are able to live in peace and security together, however distant that seems today. What the Prime Minister okay. and the Foreign Secretary have been doing in recent days, uh, meeting leaders throughout the region, is trying to work to secure right. the beginnings of that peace and, of course, to prevent a wider escalation of the conflict into a regional war. All right, let's just ask about something that we might do. Um, you've announced that under the Illegal, illegal Im uh, migration, Immigration Act, there's going to be a cap Mm. on refugee numbers, except for those from Ukraine, Afghanistan and Hong Kong. Would you consider adding uh, Palestinians to that list? Well, we already have a global scheme which is operated by the United Nations on our yeah, behalf. But I'm thinking they, about... They choose individuals... A safe legal who, route here for Palestinians. Well, well that, that is a safe uh, legal route. They choose people at their discretion who they consider to be the most vulnerable uh, in the world. And the idea of the cap is that we consult local authorities across the country, better understand what capacity there is, and if there is further capacity, then uh, think about increasing a scheme like that so that more people can come. But, but... Since 2015, remember, that we have granted over 530,000 visas for humanitarian yeah, grounds. But you, a very I, large number, I, I, the largest I'm number I'm just asking whether there might history. be a specific scheme for Palestinians. Well, well I think at the moment... Our priority is simply to get the British yeah. nationals out of Gaza oh. and to ensure there's as much humanitarian relief there. Th that's the first step. It's but quite a long way ahead before we could reach the point where we might be able to uh, see more people leaving Gaza. Because at the moment, uh, Egypt, for All example, right. is not willing to admit refugees and we understand the reasons behind that. One last thing on, on this whole area of, uh, of migration. Foreign Secretary said to me last week that if people were seen to be breaking terrorism laws by displaying support for Hamas, 
they'd be arrested, if not on the day, at some point. Um, has anyone yet been arrested? And we saw yesterday uh, people chanting jihad and so on. Uh, I know that there are arguments about exactly what jihad means, but uh, are we actually using the law in the way that Foreign Secretary and uh, Home Secretary have uh, indicated they would to clamp down on people who are intimidating in the streets, who are however obliquely chanting in support of terrorism? Well, l let me be clear. Chanting uh, jihad on the streets of London is completely reprehensible, and I never want to see scenes like that. Uh, it is inciting terrorist violence, and it needs to be tackled with the full force of the law. Ultimately, okay. uh, it's an operational matter for the police and the CPS whether uh, to okay. press charges. Arrests have been made, and there has been... Oh, really? Um, that, there have been arrests uh, since the beginning of uh, this situation, and we want to make sure that the police do everything that they can to protect Under terrorism British Jews. legislation? Um, there have been arrests under terrorist legislation, and we want to do everything that we can to okay. protect British Jews. Okay. But, but this is a broader okay. question beyond just legality. It also is a question about values. And there should be a consensus in this country that uh, chanting uh, things like jihad is completely reprehensible and wrong. All right. And we don't ever want to see that in our country. Minister, I'm only moving you on because, of course, this week there's been... Um couple of big by-elections. Some of your colleagues are saying that the problem for your party is that Rishi Sunak isn't really Tory enough. Lord Frost has called for the government to drop Rishi's, um, he used the phrase, bland vegetarianism and replace it with some red meat in the King's speech, by which he means tax cuts and an immediate reduction in legal migration. Not illegal, legal migration. Mm. You agree? Um, well, look, I was very disappointed by the by-election results. Of course we all were. We've got to reflect on that. Uh, governments do tend to suffer defeats in mid-term by-elections, and there's always local circumstances, but we need to learn lessons from that. It okay. seemed that a large number of Conservative voters didn't turn out to vote. There weren't switches to Labour. Nobody seemed to be sold on. Yeah, we've heard Keir this Starmer. message before. Well, it's the truth. That's what you saw. I mean, Labour's, uh, well, Labour's vote actually went down okay. in, in mid Bedfordshire. But to, to, your, to your point, which is an important one, we have to motivate people to vote Conservative. And the key there is right. actually delivering for the public in my area, which is immigration, we are working round the clock to Let reduce me... the amount of illegal migration, and, we, and our plan is beginning to work. Well, we have seen a substantial reduction in the number of small boat no. crossings this year versus last year. I don't ah, pretend yes. that that is uh, well, enough, but it, it does show yeah, it, that the plan that we put in place a year ago is beginning to work. You take me exactly to the point um, that, that I want to come to. As we were reflecting just before we started this, it's a year since the Prime Minister... Uh, became Prime Minister, launched his five pledges. And uh, let's, let's remind ourselves of those five pledges, or what he said about them. He said, I fully expect you to hold my government uh, to, and I to account on delivering these goals. So let, let's do a bit of that. Here are the five pledges. Ha inflation, economy, debt, blah, blah, blah. Here's how you're doing. There's an awful lot of red on that chart. I'm not going to tax you about the things that you're failing on, mm. inflation. I want to talk about the thing that you just said that you're succeeding on. 26,116 uh, on the small boat. That place does not say stop 10% of small boats. It says stop small boat. Mm. You're not doing very well, really, are you? Well, I'm not pretending that we have succeeded, this is job done. I'm saying that our plan is beginning to work. Well, you're yeah, a year on and you, you, well, well, let me you've give, only done 10% of it. Well, it's, it's a lot more than 10% than with, with all due respect. Actually, we're, we're around a quarter reduction now in small okay. boats versus last year. And if you compare that to Italy and much of uh, Europe, small boat arrivals were up by 100%. If you look at the number of Albanians coming illegally mm. to the UK, down by 90%. If you look at the number of people uh, who are being returned who shouldn't have come here, up okay. 75%. The number of raids on illegal workers, up 50%. The backlog in asylum cases is now falling rapidly. When I became but, uh, minister, I, we, the Home Office were making 400 asylum decisions a week. But last, we're now making 4,500 asylum decisions last, a week. What? So, uh, on this area, we are delivering. There's right. clearly a long way to go. Okay. And much will depend on the Supreme Court's 
court's judgment with respect to our Rwanda policy uh, due in the coming months. But we are making progress and we're going to continue to deliver for the public. I wish we could talk more, but um, maybe after a round of judgment, you'll come back and we'll see how you are doing then. Thank you. Good Minister, you. thank you very much. To our panel now, former D BBC Director General and FA Chairman Greg Dyke, the Chief Foreign Correspondent at The Sunday Times, Christina Lam, and former editor of The Sun, Kelvin McKenzie, a journalistic Manchester United, I should say. Um, of oh, former days, anyway. Um, Christina, do you think that we can forget about the idea that there will be no ground invasion now? It's going to happen, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, we saw the commander's statement last night, and obviously Israel is going to react to, to what happened two weeks ago. The question is, uh, you know, in what manner, how on earth do you do something that wants to take out Hamas in an area like that? which is so overcrowded, where you've got 2.2 million people in a, a tiny strip the size of the Isle of Wight. Uh, it, it's really built up. So this is urban warfare. So how do you do that without causing enormous amount of casualties of innocent people? And they've talked about going by air, land and sea, or air, sea and land. Um, the air part has started, really. Um, but one of the big issues is Hamas has all these tunnels which they've built over the years. They're called Hamas Metro. Uh, it's about 300 miles of tunnels. So how do you penetrate that? So I think, you know, for obvious reasons, there's been a lot of diplomatic pressure on Israel this last couple of weeks to say, you know, don't, whatever you do, yes, you want to react to what's happened. It was so terrible and shocking, but do not create something that is much, much worse and kills an awful lot of innocent people and women and children, always half the population of Gaza are children. Kelvin, you've covered and, and sent a lot of people into these war zones. Mm -hmm. Generally, used the, the, the word surgical, given what Christine's just been saying. Do you think that's possible? Well, before I, before I answer that, I thought about Jenrick describing Qatar as a reliable friend, talking about it, the UK. Can I just point out that, uh, that uh, Qatar sent £500 million to Hamas to spend as they wished? They have been a reliable friend, not to us, but to, um, to the terrorists who carried out that disgusting, revolting, atrocious massacre of the Israelis that started off this debate we're talking about. I hope that they do go in, the Israelis, and I hope that they try and reduce uh, the amount of civilian deaths to its minimal. However, it should be pointed out that the people of Gaza have allowed Hamas to run their country for 17 years and have not risen up against the oppression of uh, these terrorists. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to know why they feel that they couldn't have effectively risen up and kicked them out. Do you think the population should be punished for the actions of a few? Well, it's not about being punished. They are, there are two million of them. They voted them in. Yeah, they Why voted didn't they then they kick them out? out Pardon? They uh, can't get out. That was 2006. Greg, Greg uh, th there is an issue here, isn't there, about the way in which the non-combatants essentially can be used as human shields and so on. Uh, in Hamas. You've got connections out there. What, what do you think we're going to see down the road? I think we're going to see uh, bloodshed on a, big, on a major scale. And uh, the question I keep asking is, why did Hamas do this? Why did they start? They knew that the Israelis would have to react in this way. Why did they, why did they do this in the first place? Because of that. Well, I think... Uh, Jenrick made the point about we're trying to avoid a regional war. I suspect Hamas was trying to create a regional war. Uh, and that seems to me... But, but you know, my, my son, who was a long time in, in Palestine, um, when I ask him this, he says, well, you know, Hamas basically didn't care much about the Palestinian people. They're the, they've had 15 years where they've made no progress, they, where they've, they've become increasingly irrelevant, and they've changed that overnight. But I, I, uh, I don't see any way to avoid the sort of mass 
bloodshed that, that we all fear. I wonder if Hamas actually thought that they would be able to do as much as they did. I mean, we everybody was astonished by the intelligence failure of the Israelis. I, I wonder if they thought when they went in that they would not get as far as they did, that this would have been a smaller operation. Because, uh, you know, obviously the reaction... Do you think, do you think sending in a thousand, a thousand Hamas terrorists who value, you know, death up more highly than they value life, it wasn't well, going to lead we, to a we, mass slaughter? We did... We discussed previously on, on the programme exactly this point about... You know, it's a horrible way to describe it, how easy they found it. And I think part of the... Um, explanation that some people have is that the Israelis were so distracted by the argument that's going on about the Supreme Court and the uh, protests against Mr Netanyahu's uh, government and so on, that they moved some of the troops who would have been uh, defending that fence. Mm. And actually, as Christina suggests, anybody who came through that fence might have been surprised at how light the defences were. I think that's true, and I think the Israelis underestimated um, Hamas's capabilities. I think everybody outside did, actually. They were, they were cunning, Hamas, weren't they? They were going around saying, we're, we're never going to go to war, we're defeated and all the rest of it, and, in fact, we're arming themselves and getting, the, getting their Iranian friends to do it for them as well. Yes, they took advantage of that. They, sh they, they Hamas, should be punished and punished hard for that. Can I just qu quickly take up one other small... Point, which is not specifically about uh, the situation there, but the risk uh, to U the Ukraine situation. Um, I think some people now think that there's a danger of a pivot from Ukraine because of the tension uh, and the urgency, I guess, of the situation in the Middle East, and uh, the Ukrainians are clearly anxious about that. Yeah, I feel very strongly about this. I, I literally just came back from Ukraine this week, and so I was there when this happened. And even before this, there was already this feeling of Ukraine fatigue, that there's just been elections in Slovakia, which elected a pro-Putin leader, all the chaos in the Republican Party over the Speaker, delaying aid from the US. So, and, you know, people talking about how the counteroffensive is not achieving as much as was hoped, although, you know, they have made some important strategic gains actually around Crimea, taking out Russian um, warships and submarine. But the fact is that on most of that front line, which is very long, a thousand miles, they have not made very much progress. So. I think the Ukrainians feel very strongly that people, the world cannot focus on two major wars at once and that they're going to be distracted. So I think the big winner, actually, in all this is Mr Putin. I'm going to come, I'm going to come back and talk to you three about the domestic politics that we discussed with Jenrick in a moment. But it's coming up to 9 o'clock. You're watching Sunday Morning with Trevor Phillips. In the last hour, the Immigration Minister has told this programme the government thinks around 10 British people are still being held hostage in Gaza. Robert Jenrick says he wants Israel to act surgically when trying to eradicate Hamas in Gaza. Now, as so often at times of war and tension, nuance gets lost, and we've seen it throughout this conflict. Hamas, proscribed as terrorists by the UK government, may wield power in Gaza, but it is not recognised even by Arab states as the representative of the Palestinian people. Internationally, it's the Palestinian Authority that's recognised and both speaks for the Palestinian people and runs things in the West Bank. Hussam Zomlot is the ambassador and head of the Palestinian mission to the UK and joins me now. Good morning, Mr Zomlot. Good morning. Um, as I've just been saying, you do not represent Hamas and I'm not going to ask you to speak for that organisation. But um, the person in administration declared three days of mourning uh, for the several thousand Palestinian non-combatants who've died, numbers still rising. What is the mood in Gaza and the West Bank? Unseen, as per Oxfam, the UK Oxfam, uh, who has a uh, uh, presence in Gaza, a situation of a humanitarian catastrophe, carnage, horror in every sense, 
Families have to make choices of uh, should they leave, should they stay. Families are thinking of rationing water with children and which child can sustain more. Uh, Oxfam, the UN, are describing a situation that is simply unprecedented in, uh, in, in recent history and perhaps unprecedented period. And uh, this is really catastrophic. And this links to the point of Israel and the propaganda. And I, you know, I've heard the Israeli ambassador here in this studio saying that there is no such a thing as a humanitarian crisis in Gaza. We are providing everything. And this brings me to how significant and important that we truly, truly uh, be responsible in the reporting. I thank Sky for clarifying uh, yesterday uh, the misrepresentation of words I said on CNN earlier. Um, and really, this is an opportunity that we call on everybody to be responsible and to be accurate. You know, Trevor... Indeed, we try. Uh, 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 and thank you. But you know what? Now is the moment. This is a moment for international responsibility. Remember 20 years ago? Let, let, uh, remember Iraq? It's very indeed, important. I, I Weapons of mass destruction, I'm it has leave. caused millions of lives. I'm going to come to so that. So words cost millions of lives. I, I want to come to that. But let's talk, for, to begin with, about the loss of life that's taking place. And you've spoken uh, about the loss of life on, in Gaza. You'll also recognise that many British people lost relatives and friends in Israel on October the 7th. What, what would you say, you're speaking as a representative of the Palestinian people, to them this morning to recognise their loss? I hope and we will work with them, and we are, that uh, their loved ones are freed and returned very soon. I'm not talking uh, about them. I'm talking about the 1,300, 1,400 who died uh, in that weekend, including the 200 or so who died because they were at a music festival. Trevor... What, what would you say to the families of those people? It's tragic. And I, I, I feel with every family, I lost six of my extended family only last week. I know what it feels. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, this has been our position for 30 years. And it's not the Palestinian Authority, it's the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Indeed. Organization that I represent. And by the way, it's not just the Arab world and the world that recognize the PLO. Hamas doesn't claim to represent the Palestinian people. This is, we are the umbrella. But Hamas is not part of the Palestinian political uh, system. Now, um, having said all that, 22 Arab states, including mine and my government, have condemned targeting civilians from all sides. The one missing condemnation is from Israel. I haven't heard any Israeli official condemn. We, I haven't heard anybody asking them we, to, we, to we, condemn. We, our, our position is very clear. And you know what, Trevor? Allow, I, me, for, allow me for this sentence. Yes, go ahead. Coolly. This is no longer about the question. This is, I'm sorry, this is no longer about the answer. Our answer is clear for 30 years. We have committed to nonviolence and negotiations. Israel did it. Look yeah. what happened in the let, West let, Bank. We have let, committed to international deal, resolutions. And I, no, I will Israel deal, didn't. I will deal, we have committed... If I may. We have, com we have committed... If uh, I may ask a question. <laughs> I will deal with Israelis when no, no. they come. But I want to just... Because people want to be clear, and I've stressed that you speak for the Palestinian people in, in all a of different... Them. Yeah, all of them. As, as a whole. And I want to give you the opportunity, because I think this is, part of the, this is part of the way that perhaps we might make the dialogue different, Perfect. to make clear to people here, and maybe in Israel, who lost relatives, that uh, you offer your condolences and you think that was wrong. I just want you to be clear about that, without the complications. I offer my condolences? Yes. To civilian lives? Of course. Okay. You know, you, you know, let me, let me have a, a follow-up follow sentence here. This is not about the answer. Our answer has been there for 30 years. This is about the question. And that's what we are trying to challenge. The question insinuates, insinuates that we, our lives matter less. I don't think so. No, no, Trevor. I, yeah, no, you, no, you know that's not no, what I'm suggesting. No, it does. No, it does. I, I no, want does. You, okay, no, does. let me, let me put know, this in a different you know, you know, killings in the West Bank... The killings in the West Bank has been happening all over last year and I, this year. Record numbers, house demolition, 
records number. I want to come to that. And this conversation I, never I, happens I, until I, I, I Israelis are harmed. You I bring us here and I may, you I do, say, I do, want to ask do you condemn? Do you no, sympathize? Do you I feel with I, them? I, I, this is the asymmetry, I want to, I want the imbalance ask, that we need to address. About that. I haven't asked you to... Our lives matter I have not asked equally, you to... Especially I, for I a person not, like you, Trevor. All human beings are equal. I have not... I know you get asked that question a lot, but I have not asked you to condemn anybody. I've just asked you to do as you've done, which is to express that human sympathy. Can I just ask you one more point about this? Do you think that Hamas's action has made your aim, the PLO's aim, of the two-state solution less likely? And was it therefore a mistake? We just started saying we should be accurate. And to be accurate in front of your viewers, we have provided a different path 30 years ago, PLO, Yas Arafat. Indeed. The world. The Oslo that, Accords and all of that. That different path was based on international consensus that includes the UK, the US, and everybody. That is so-called two-state solution that would give Israel its territory, its security, guarantees, and will give us our right of self-determination. That was the compromise. And by the way, it was a very difficult compromise on us because we were supposed to accept 22% of our historic land. We accepted it. That path was undermined by successive Israeli governments that built settlements, 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 that now creating a Palestinian state is becoming more and more an impossibility, and you know that. Hamas and all other groups are part of that failure to actually head in the direction we wanted to head towards. Part of the international failure to enforce their own Consensus. You think now, they have undermined now, and the, and, and, and your uh, aim? Yeah, uh, the, uh, yeah I, I, I think the Israeli unwillingness to really, really go genuinely We're in that path. We're talking about Hamas here. Yeah. To go in that path, we're talking about the two-state solution and a solution. Uh, to go in that path have, have created all the situation, not only in Gaza, by the way. Look, look. Everybody was talking in the last couple of years that Israel is annexing the settlements. Trevor, what happened practically, yeah. effectively, it's the settlements, the illegal settlements that annexed Israel. That's what happened. You, you, okay. you, you spoke about the judicial reform and the demonstration. It's the Bengvirs and the okay. Smotrich of the day who are taking over. And what Israel is doing right now has nothing to do with Hamas. Okay. It's revenge. Look, look. Okay. Revenge and supremacists who want to use the moment I, to actually finish off. I, I'm, I'm, finish trying, off. I'm trying not to get the language heightened here. Let's just come back to what's been happening in re recent days. What does the Palestinian Authority think actually happened at the al aqli Arab Hospital in Gaza last week? Who bears responsibility for the deaths? Overall, it's Israel, and in this particular incident, it is Israel as well. Overall, because Israel is an occupying power, and Trevor, you know international law, they should be providing protection when they know there is a hospital and there are hundreds of doctors, of medical staff, of nurses, of patients, of you, people you, taking reviews. They should provide protection. But practically you, speaking, you, we don't believe, we don't believe that such firepower is owned by anybody, not only in Palestine, but in the region, except Israel. Sorry, sorry. One. just, to, to, just one. to be clear, you, do you think the missiles that fell on uh, that hospital were uh, fired by Israel or not? Yes, fired by Israel. You still believe? Yes. Uh, in, spi uh, in spite of the fact that the evidence that's been shown by the United States, Canada, uh, by some independent observers, who are you, these? You, you, think who are these, that, you think that they are, are all these? wrong uh, you, and that it is still Israel okay, okay, that, I, that, we, uh, that destroyed that part of that hospital? There is a British lawyer now is the prosecutor of the ICC. His name is Karim Khan. Send him. And whatever Karim Khan decides, we will accept. We are certain that that was an Israeli bombardment. And I you know what? Let's not, let's not focus on that incident. Is, only, only a day later, they bombarded the third oldest but church you, on but, earth. But, the third oldest but, church but, on earth, but, killing 18 Palestinian Christians. Okay. And you tell me this is about Hamas. But, but and you, you tell know, me that Israel you know doesn't do that this. Israel, I mean, you know that Israel denies because, that it had 
that, uh, any, that, it, that it did anything of that kind or that it fired on that hospital. You know that, don't you? I know exactly uh, the Israeli trek for 75 years. Oh, come on. No, 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 what, come on. Shirin Abu Akli, the prominent Palestinian. Okay, so you uh, think the Israelis uh, are just lying? A, no, 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 when they see an outlier, an outcry, sorry, by okay. people of conscience like you, when they know that what they did was absolutely horrific, the first thing they do, they deny it. And the logic, always uh, the logic, the logic always, Israel right, is we, blameless. The Palestinians killed themselves. All right, we just... The, the Palestinians killed just, themselves. <laughs> okay. We're just going to move on. We're, we're clear. You think it was Israel. I, Israel uh, denies it. Now, um, let me just uh, come on to the, the question, if you like, about the future, mm -hmm. um, how we get out of this. Um, is there any possibility that the relatively moderate leadership that uh, is provided by the PLO, by Fatah within the PLO, is ever going to be uh, dominant in Gaza at the moment? Because it is not, is it? Well, uh, the issue here is a change in the Israeli public and the political system is required. No, but, is, what, is it but for... there are 2.3 million Gazans yeah. who, I know, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, voted for Hamas. Hamas is still the authority in Gaza. What I'm really asking you is, do you think that there is any possibility that the trend of uh, Palestinian thought that you represent, which is the, yeah. if you like, the, the, the heir to uh, Arafat and the Fatah, the people who uh, got the Oslo Accords, who got the Palestine to recognise Israel, is that ever going to be in charge in Gaza again? Of course, but within a, a, a holistic overall political process that links Gaza to the West Bank and Jerusalem, the two-state solution is effectively ending Israel's occupation that began in 1967. East Jerusalem is the capital, a fair uh, resolution to the issue of refugees in accordance with international law. And for that resolution, the PLO is ready. And when time comes, and when there is genuine, sufficient international support for that, and it's long so over... it's the Israelis who have to... You, I, I mean, the Israelis I don't want to, can't, I want, can't do I don't, all the work for you. I don't want to... You know, no, they should. They should. If you believe in the two-state solution, you can do it tomorrow. All right. You can okay. do it tomorrow. And we are ready to do it. If you can really want to end the occupation, if you want to empower the, the Palestinian national institutions, we are here. OK. Can, can I just ask you very quickly one last question about here? You were on the march in London, pro-Palestinian yes, march was. yesterday. But, but, uh, but, but Trevor, can I say one, one can, last question? Can, can, can I ask you the question? <laughs> yeah. La last week, uh, we talked about people with pictures of hand gliders on their clothes, uh, people carrying Hamas flags, uh, some of the chants that were distressing and intimidating, to, Against... particularly to Jewish people mm. here. I, I assume that you would say that you were as dismayed, possibly disgusted, as others were by the behaviour of people who aren't just there to support Palestine, but, uh, in a sense, to create a division. Not only dismayed, uh, this is abhorrent, uh, unacceptable, uh, those people hijack our cause for their own twisted logic. Uh, the Jewish people have nothing to do with it. This okay. is not a religious conflict. Okay. Many of those who demonstrated for Palestine yesterday were Jews. Many of those strong voices are Jewish okay. people defend defending us. Okay. And uh, those uh, who have hate in their hearts for Jews would, right. would have hate in their hearts for Muslims and Christians. Uh, and we, ha we have nothing to do with them and they okay. should shut up. Ambassador, thank you very much. You've been very clear, and we will come back at time in due course. Um, let me turn again to our panel, if I may. And, uh, Greg, uh, what do you make of what the ambassador has been saying about, if you like, what might be the real, what he regards as the real views of Palestinians as opposed to what we hear from Hamas? Well, I think there's clearly a difference between Hamas and the Palestinian people. Uh, Hamas have, just taken, have taken action which is going to lead, to, the, sadly, to the death of many of the Palestinian people. But um, I, I th <sighs> what you got to look at, if you believe that... Now, the interesting question is about Netanyahu and what it means for him after 
this is all completed. And, you know, after the, the, the bloodletting, I found, I, I did find um, Biden's it, remarks very interesting. Don't make the mistakes we made after 9-11. I thought that was a, quite a profound statement. And I, I suspect Netanyahu's government will make those mistakes. They, and, but Netanyahu has, has spent 10 years offering basically security to the people of, of, um, of Israel. And suddenly the security isn't there. Kelvin? Well, <clears throat> the ambassador there talked about the two-state solution. The truth about the matter is, for 75 years, um, it's become quite clear that um, uh, the Palestinians really want, or the, the people that control Palestine really want, a one-state solution, which is no Jews in the Middle East. They want to drive them out. That's the reality of it all. And Hamas are actually carrying out... Um, That's a bit harsh, isn't it? I mean, he was quite clear yeah. that he think, uh, that they... Yeah, this is Israel. what he says, but he's not in control. The people who are in control in Gaza, right? They don't want a two-state solution. They don't want any solution. They enjoy what they do. They love the violence. They love killing Jews. That's the reality of it. And actually, I tell you what, I am looking forward to A, revenge, and B, justice. That's the position of, you know, extremists. The fact is, like, when I started out as a foreign correspondent 30 years ago, the Middle East conflict, the Palestinian conflict, was the biggest issue in foreign news. You know, a huge amount of diplomatic effort was expended on trying to um, reach some kind of agreement. Lots of books were written, lots of people went and reported. Um, and then 9-11 happened and we all got distracted by other things, by Afghanistan, by Iraq, um, and the world sort of moved on and the issue hadn't been resolved. And this, what happened, I'm not in any way condoning what happened two weeks ago, that was the most sickening, horrendous thing. I mean, it's just heartbreaking to think about what happened. But this is what happens if you don't deal with issues. You can't just leave something they've had, they've like had, they've that had, for They've all had those 16, years. 17 years of, of a potential two-state solution coming from but somebody, and it doesn't exist. It does not exist. In recent years. They want to drive. They want to drive the Jews out well, of that land. That's the truth. Greg, it's not what he I'm, said. I'm Greg. not sure that was. Tr that's true. But he, I mean, he's not in charge of it. No, no, but but, no, no, but the, they did have a position. Where, where the two-state solution was very close. It was very close to, to happening, and it didn't. And the Israeli government of the years since has been further to the right and further uh, opposed to that. If you're being attacked on all sides, you are going to go right. Well, yeah, that's the truth this, about the matter. the amount of that would happen happen legal in this settlements that they've been building Chris, this year. Chris, Chris, I mean, yeah. they have been extremely provocative. It, uh, they, it could they, be. It could they be. want to defend themselves. But I Kelvin, see nothing it could wrong be with that. The, they're illegal. You know, on, Greg's but we turn. do make the assumption that there is always a solution to political issues, and maybe there is no solution. I mean, this is one of the things I personally find it very difficult covering because it does feel intractable on both sides. You've got people who who don't you feel don't really want to resolve oh, no, it. That, that's, that's completely it untrue. Does... The Israelis want to deal. They want the two-state solution. They can't get it when people like Hamas are literally prepared to to bayonet children. Well, well and let, let's remind us. Let's, let's, re, let's remind that this uh, the ambassador is not Hamas. In fact. Uh, in this conversation, I think he went further than I've seen most Palestinian representatives uh, on television recently to distance himself from Hamas. So I think to be fair to him, we just need to accept... But I'm, I'm that not being unfair I, to your, him. Your point that he is not in control, I yeah. think, is completely correct. Greg? And as you said to him, I mean, Hamas, who's not going to say that publicly, but has put them in a very difficult position. Hmm. Well, that's why... I... We're going back to what I said at the beginning. Why did Hamas do it? And they did it, I suspect, because they, by creating some sort of regional war, they think that in the end they'll benefit. Kelvin, you've made your position pretty clear about revenge and all that, but in the real world, if I can put it that way, what do we do to be helpful? If I know that's a kind of weedy word, but... We have a job to do here, don't, don't we? We have a job. We have a job to try and protect our people who have been... who are now hostages and wondering whether they're going to live for another two minutes and they've already killed a dozen 
so British people. We have a big investment there, and we should be supporting Israel with everything we've got, and I admire Sunak for what he said, to be truthful. Christina, uh, uh, what uh, should we be doing? You know, we are supporting Israel, but I think we also have to make very clear, as Biden and others have made clear, that... You know, you have to think about what happens next. As, you know, I covered what happened as a result of 9-11 in Afghanistan and Iraq, the hundreds and thousands, millions of people that were, were killed. It's, yes, Israel has got overwhelming military force. It could go in and destroy Gaza tomorrow. But what happens next? And that's what they need to think about. Coming up... We'll get an update from uh, the latest situation as aid tries to get through from Egypt. I'll be speaking live to the United Nations Under Secretary General. Stone and I'm Sky's correspondent based here in Washington, D.C. Oh, street. Well, the plan seems to be to head to the police station where the policeman who fired the shots was based. And everything you know his memories is all gone. I've witnessed the remarkable passion for politics here, but the anger too. We have to get Trump out of the White House. I'm playing devil's advocate. You get your political agenda. No, it's God, honestly... God love you. And beyond the United States, I report from around the world. This is a town that is effectively encircled by the Russians. We take you to the heart of stories that shape our planet. Oh, yeah, I can hear now quite a few explosions uh, in the distance here in Jerusalem. What do you think of ISIS? Everybody here, they know the truth of ISIS. have made it out of the car. Welcome to Backstage, the film and TV podcast.
Welcome back. This is Sunday Morning with Trevor Phillips. In the last 24 hours, some 20 lorries of aid have crossed from Egypt to Gaza, where the situation remains grim. And I can speak now to the United Nations Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs. That's Martin Griffiths. Uh, Martin, it's live in Cairo now. Good morning. Good morning to you, Trevor. Thank you for having me on the programme. Thank you for being with us. What can you tell us about the situation at the Rafa crossing this morning? Are there more lorries going across? Do you expect more today? We had hoped for more today. And we had hoped for more today for a reason. The reason being that for the people of Gaza, they, as people anywhere, you and me included, would want to see uninterrupted aid coming through reliably every single day so that they know what to expect and so that the quantity is enough for them. You know, 20 trucks yesterday was a very good start, but it's nowhere near enough to provide for the needs of up to 2 million people. So we'd hope for more today. I'm not sure we're going to get it, Trevor. We're deep in negotiation at the moment with the Israelis, the Egyptians, with huge amount of help, by the way, from the United States. But we're deep in negotiation about the essence of the inspection regime that understandably needs to take place in a war situation. W warring parties always want to check what aid is going in to make sure it doesn't include guns or, or whatever. We're used to this uh, in many parts of the world, but we want to make sure it's an inspection regime that's efficient, quick, hopefully random, hopefully light, and doesn't slow down the process. So we're, we're looking into this today. If they don't go today, we certainly expect, assume, and plan for trucks to move in tomorrow. So to be clear, there's still work to do. And, and more trucks. There's still work to do well, in clearing yeah, the way. Yeah. And you think that, in fact, there probably won't be any more going across today or, or unless until that work is done i'm a bit i'm a bit pessimistic this morning trevor and probably i shouldn't be you know it's not the right approach to life in a situation of such brutal brutal tragedy um i'd like to see more go across this afternoon but if they don't we damn well want to see more going across tomorrow now there are a number of things that need to happen I've mentioned already the inspection regime. This week is also going to be a week for the United Nations and its associated agencies of operational planning. We made a breakthrough yesterday to get yep. trucks in, the first access. That's the, obviously the first priority. Now we need to make sure that we have all the right aid in place with a pipeline of the right aid coming through. Each agency knows which aid it uh, has in in its hands to deliver to who it needs to happen right. to. And can I make one final crucial point? People need to be able to choose where they live safely and not be herded to places by others. There is no is such that, thing are you, in Is the that UN you saying Lexicon that you think the Israelis are wrong, are wrong to ask uh, Gazans to move to the south, southern half of the Strip? No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm saying that people have a right to choose when to move, where to move, and when to move again. They have that right under international law. It is absolutely right for the Israelis to say, look, if you stay where you are, you may come up uh, under attack and there may be peril, and you need to consider that in your decisions, your voluntary decisions about moving. No, what I'm saying is this. People should be allowed to decide where they move to. Right. They, they, there's an old okay. construct. You and I will know about it very well from Bosnia, yep. about safe zones. We do not believe in safe zones. We believe in people's choice about safety. All right. Mr Biden and Mr Sunak and also uh, Mr Schultz have all been in the region trying to stop what they are calling contagion, i.e. the conflict spreading. Um, yeah. The United yeah. Nations Secretary General, your boss, made an impassioned plea uh, at the Rafa crossing yesterday in front of locked gates. It feels as though all of this international activity, it might have helped a bit mm. in getting lorries across, 
But the system doesn't seem to be getting us towards a solution in any way at all. A political solution, do you mean? Yes, um, even a temporary political solution, or an operational that, solution. Would, that would lead to some kind of cessation of, of violence. Uh, immediate cessation of the violence that's taking place yeah. at the moment. I don't mean a long-term solution. No, well, what the, what the Secretary General said there, and he said it again at this summit yesterday outside Cairo, very, very, very clearly, is the need for what he called a humanitarian ceasefire. In other words, we need to know safe corridors, safe paths of access, safe places where people choose to live, and to receive aid. People need to know where they're safe. And, by the way, under international humanitarian law, places like hospitals and schools and civilian institutions are always legally safe. And that is why we choose, uh, with UNRWA, our main agency, of course, in Gaza, relief and work to use system. their institutions, many of which authority. are those. The, the Relief and Works uh, Authority that we use a lot of their institutions where many people have fled from the north to be safe in their schools and hospitals and other institutions. Those are protected areas. Oh. They are, as we put it, deconflicted and have been for many, many years. Okay. They are not subject under the law to attack. Let me put this to you, Mr Griffiths. The, 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 I think for many people watching all of this unfold, understanding the efforts, the complications of it, the difficulties of it, many things that we don't know about and can't know about because they involve uh, private negotiations and so on. But from the outside, uh, it seems extraordinary that with all of the attention, all of the governments, all of the most powerful people concentrating on this area, we can't just get some lorries of food and water into this place. And that seems, from the outside, to look like, in a sense, uh, a signal of the failure and impotence of the United Nations system itself. Well, I, of course, would disagree with you on that. The United Nations itself, the system itself, we have been working from the first day, from that awful April the 7th, every single day to get those trucks in. The decision as to who lets trucks in and who lets trucks out is not a, a decision by people like me. We want trucks in every day. By the way, this is not the only part of the world where we see difficulties of getting aid to people. Go to Sudan, as you know. You will see the same situation there. Yeah. Go to Afghanistan. Go elsewhere. Yeah. What we see is a world in which okay. violence and war has become an instrument of policy. OK. Ms Griffiths, thank, you, the case thank of, you very in, much. In, in I the no, case have of, no doubt we'll be speaking to each other again. Coming up, I'll speak to Labour's Lisa Nandy.
Welcome back. This is Sunday Morning with Trevor Phillips. Some aid is trickling into Gaza, woefully short of what's required. The UK is a big player on the global development stage, and Rishi Sunak's been trying to use our diplomatic influence on a trip to the region. He's been backed by the opposition, but domestic politics hasn't been on pause. It's been a good week for Labour with two huge by-election victories. I can speak now to Shadow International Development Minister Lisa Nandy. Good morning. Good morning. Um, are you comfortable with the tone and substance of our government's response to the conflict so far? Well, I think everybody is using a great deal of care at the moment, particularly because there are 200 hostages still being, being held in Gaza. There are rockets still flying from Hamas into Israeli territory. And there is a humanitarian catastrophe looming for the people of Gaza. We've got to get the hostages out and we've got to get far more aid in, particularly fuel, which has become a serious emergency. So I think it's right that the government is taking care in the way that they're approaching this and adding to the international efforts to get more aid through the Rafah crossing. And in that, we absolutely support them. Uh, we support Israel's right to self-defence and to return the hostages. And we support the Palestinian people, especially in Gaza, at what is a desperately, desperately critical, difficult time where the world simply cannot afford to walk away. We've got to urgently step up. I've just been talking to Martin Griffiths, the United Nations boss uh, out there, who I think you know or know about. He sounded, I have to say, extremely depressed, and he was pretty clear. There's nothing moving today, and at the moment it doesn't look like they've got the the deal to get more across. I mean, he's right to be seriously concerned. We all are. Overnight, I had reports from aid agencies working on the ground that the hospitals are powering down for lack of fuel, that incubators for newborn babies are being turned off. I've had reports from UNRWA that they've lost contact with people in the north, but it appears that they're running out of food as well as having already run out of fresh drinking water. We've got to step this up and get aid and fuel in particular across the border within hours, not days. And I can completely understand why Martin is sounding uh, very weary about it. But I can assure you, having spoken to him and many, many others over the last 72 hours, that we are absolutely determined that we'll find a way to overcome the practical barriers and ensure that that happens. There are, as you'll know, Trevor, very real concerns from the Israeli government, particularly about fuel and whether the, the, that fuel could fall into the hands of Hamas who've been seizing what they can uh, in order to fire rockets into Israeli territory. The UN is doing a huge amount of work to show that UN sites are safe spaces to open up a humanitarian corridor through Gaza so the aid doesn't just get in but gets north as well. Yeah, uh, and we've been pressing our counterparts in government to offer more in the way of assistance, particularly technical assistance, in order to help make that happen. That, that, is a, that is a point that has been made um, by the government and by the Israelis. Uh, there are those in the Labour ranks who are a bit uneasy and they think that without condoning or even excusing Hamas's actions, um, you, Labour, the Labour leadership, have lined up with the government in a way that is essentially uh, lining up with the true, what they regard as a true aggressor. Israel. Um, is Labour essentially divided on this? Labour's always been a friend to both Israel and Palestine. And that's true for Keir, that's true for David Lammy, that's true for me as well. And the only solution for the Palestinian people and for the Israeli people is two states living side by side in peace. Now, that has become a very distant prospect, particularly for the Palestinians over at least the last decade and a half. The truth is people in Gaza have been running out of hope. They've been watching settlements being built in the West Bank, illegal settlements that are making the prospect of a one-state, uh, two-state solution very, very difficult indeed. And the world hasn't shown the same level...